he learns that his son has died. And mm-hmm. instead of sort of crying and shouting and breaking things, he um, dances. So he dances as a beggar. That's right. And that idea of, yeah. <laughs> um, Welcome, everyone, to the Stoic Salon podcast, where we talk about life, love, work, play, the universe, and Stoicism. And today, I'm especially excited to be talking with Dr. Nancy Sherman. Nancy Sherman is an ethicist with a focus on ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, In recent years, she has turned to Stoic ethics. She has recently written and um, the book is newly available. Stoic Wisdom, Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience. And this takes a fresh look at the Stoics and their strategies for finding calm. Nancy Sherman has worked with the military for several decades in connection with Stoic ethics, post-traumatic stress and moral injury. Her interest in the military, however, goes way back to her childhood. Her dad was a World War II vet who uh, never talked about his war, though he, he carried his dog tags, as she writes on her website. He, carry, she, he carried his dog tags on his keychain for 65 years She writes that his war wasn't something that he could share. It was a private burden. And uh, she came to think that she needed to share that burden or at least understand the military service a bit better. So she was appointed Distinguished Chair in Ethics at the US Naval Academy in the mid-90s and wrote so much about all of that she wrote um, a trilogy, in fact, about the moral challenges of going to war and returning home. So you may already know the books, Stoic Warriors is one, The Untold War, which uh, became a New York Times notable book and after war. Nancy Sherman has research um, training in psychoanalysis and a long-standing interest in the emotions, um, which is also a, a prominent theme in the early work on on her early work on Aristotle and Kant. More recently, she's focused on how to express ourselves through the emotions, and she's even explored dance and cadenced march, which absolutely fascinates me because I do have a dance background so I'll definitely want to know a bit more about that. Um, She's developed a piece called Dancers and Soldiers Sharing the Dance Floor um, uh, at the New York uh, Centre for Ballet and that was in the um, in in 2017. Uh, She's been honoured with so many fellowships for her work including a Guggenheim Fellowship at NEH and CLS fellowships, Mellon fellowships and fellowships at the Wilson Centre in DC. She holds a distinguished rank of university professor and she's professor of philosophy at Georgetown. Earlier in her career, she taught at Yale. She writes on her website that she loves the classroom and she regularly teaches at undergraduate and graduate levels. So like imagine being one of her students. Um, Beyond the classroom uh, and the books, given the chance, she says she'll head out outdoors and walk and hike. Swimming is her real passion. Um, and uh, she likes to hike. She likes to hike as a family. And uh, after all the hiking, back at home, cooking. It's cooking. Cooking is a serious family business. Um, and her husband, Marshall, uh, well, He's known as Chef Marcel. He's an incredibly good cook and a dedicated pickler. So there's absolutely so much there that I'm dying to start a conversation about. And on that note, I think it's time for me to to say hello and to welcome Nancy Sherman to the podcast. So let's get started. Welcome everyone to the Stoic Salon podcast, where we talk about Life, love, work, 
play the universe and stoicism and today i'm really excited to be talking with nancy sherman nancy what a pleasure thank you so much and thank you it's a pleasure to be here i'm really delighted thank you Uh, thank you so much for joining me because um we're all very excited about you and your new book but we'll talk about the book thing a bit later first i want to know a bit about you and um What I tend to be asking everyone, I'm just very curious about everyone's path to stoicism and the path to to a flourishing life, which I guess through stoicism, we we sort of, you know, step onto that path. Um, Yeah. So if you like, um, what was your path to stoicism? How did you get there? Did someone say, hey, the stoics come over here? What happened? What was life like before the stoics? What was that point at which you met the stoics, the encounter? And what's life after? And you can bring in personal work, whatever it is. I'd love to, to hear about that if that sounds good. Sounds great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I love getting personal because philosophy for me is deeply personal. Um, A secret. It's a dirty secret. I came to the Stoics as I'm a a philosopher of ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. And uh, I've worked on Aristotle um, much of my uh, life. I'm you know, it's one of my best friends, Arist- Aristotle's ethics in particular, but I studied Aristotle as an undergraduate metaphysics. So I come to the Stoics thinking about flourishing because that is the Greek theme um, and the idea of thriving. And particularly, um, I've studied the ancient, ancient ethics because of flourishing in a community, flourishing as a social being. I think when I read Aristotle's Ethics, and I found that two out of 10 of the books of Nicomachean Ethics, and same in, in the Eudemian and uh, similar amounts um, in Spurious Magna Moralia, it was about friendship, philia, and I was beside myself. I think I was at that time, well, I finished my thesis, my dissertation, I defended it on the day of my daughter's first birthday, June 5. In wow. fact, <laughs> so it was moment- five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a momentous day for you too wow. um, on the conference, conference day. So um, that was a long, long time ago. So I, I'm steeped in ancient ethics, uh, you know, so, uh, so for me, it's a, um, it's a slow journey of a, of a, of a philosophy that doesn't stand alone. It's part of a, a, a corpus, a large group of philosophy, uh, philosophical thinkers. And to be frank, Stoicism in the academy was slow to get a footing because the texts are all here and there. I mean, there's Epictetus and there's Marcus Aurelius. Those are nice big texts. And there's a million texts of Seneca, who's one of my favorites. But the the founding Stoics, Zeno, Cleantes, and Chrysippus, are just texts that have been restored for us um, in, in part by a guy named Diogenes Laertius, a little bit by Plutarch, a lot by Cicero. So there, it's not like reading the Republic, which if, you know many undergraduates read and devour um, or hate. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually came to it not through the you know through the usual path of education. But I was teaching at the Naval Academy in the mid 90s. So that's many decades ago. I was called in to um, remediate, not a word I like, but uh, to help out with 133 midshipmen. That's cadets, essentially, um, equivalent of your uh, folks who are training for uh, the Royal Navy uh, and our Marines. And they had cheated on an electrical engineering exam. And it being we're right in the gaze of Washington, D.C., it was under the gaze of all eyes. Uh, and as a result, uh, they needed to fix the problem quickly. So I was brought in to stand up, a good military term, to stand up a course uh, on ethics. In addition to journaling, which is something you do, Catherine, but in addition to work in the field. And these were individuals who stood a chance to be 
separated is the, the military term from the academy. And because the academy is a, a nationally paid public institution, the military academies are, I'm not sure how it works in Britain. I'm, I presume similarly, um, Dartmouth is the right your Navy um, equivalent. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were going to be also prosecuted, some of them, um, through inspector generals and whatnot. So it was a really serious, serious business. Anyway, I taught a course, which is sort of like many courses I teach. It's intro ethics, you know, we, we do a little of this, we begin with Aristotle, or we do some Kant about lying, and we talk about John Stuart mm -hmm. Mill and Bentham. But I waited for the Stoics to the end and our ship had arrived. This was their philosophy. They read, you know, the skinny handbook, the Epictet you know, Epictetus is in Caridium. But one of their own was a Stoic and had survived through Stoicism. And that was Jim Stockdale, James Bond mm. Stockdale, Admiral Stockdale. Mm. So I would, you have to understand, I was teaching side by side with mm. admirals. So we call them flag officers because um, flags go up where they live with one or two or three or four stars. And um, marine captains, that's very high up, just shy of being a general. And some generals and many who had been in Vietnam. They knew the story of Stockdale, which I'll tell right now. And also people that were naval aviators who had just come back from flying over a place called the Basra Road. That was the first Gulf War um, mm. over Basra, which became very important um, years later, 20 or so years later, mm. or 15. So the story about Stockdale is that he had been a student at Stanford, mid-career, mid he got mid-career training. And he wandered into the philosophy department, international relations wasn't quite his thing. And the Dean of Humanities gave him, I don't have it here, but you know, the skinny in Caridian. And he, I interviewed him several times late in life. He was in San Diego, Coronado. And he said, what would a martini drinking, golf playing naval aviator need with that? <laughs> But he memorized it, a quick study he was. He memorized it. Yeah, you know, he had long nights on the USS Ticonderoga mm. a carrier in the Straits near Mekong Delta. And in, I think it was 1965, he was flying. He's an aviator uh, over North Vietnam, and he was shot down. And as he parachuted um, from his Skyhawk, I think it was, he said, uh, this James Bond Stockdale 007, leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus. And he said, five years down there. This was what he muttered to himself, these very prescient words. Well, he was pummeled, broke his leg, and, and it was broken many, many times thereafter. And while in the, it's called the Hanoi Hilton or the North Vietnamese prisoner of war camp. He uh, used Epictetus essentially as his salvation. And it, um, you know, the idea was that he could somehow control what was out there and if not give a positive spin to it, empower himself mm. in deprivation. Deprivation is the name of the game if you are a midshipman, a cadet for four years at an academy. You know, you lose your name, you lose your identity in some ways. You get, you get hammered for uh, any kinds of infractions, you know, drinking on the weekend, not making your bed the right way, not squaring the corners when you march, um, putting Tupperware <laughs> in your locker and forgetting to put your, you know, cover on when you're your, 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 your hat, your cap when you're outside. And so the idea that's of stoicism, which as many have said, is a, is a philosophy for toughing it out mm. or sucking it up. This was the mantra, embrace the suck. It's a pretty inelegant phrase or yeah. suck it up and truck on. Mm. So mm. I saw stoicism at that point through the eyes of 
my midshipman. And later I came to interview Stockdale several times and in fact helped set up a center at the Naval Academy called the Stockdale Center for um, Ethics and Leadership. And so I, I knew that, but I also, I'm a training in psychoanalysis. I don't practice, but I have done research training for years. And I've always been interested since my first days of graduate school in the emotions. That's just mm -hmm. where my heart has always been and philosophically. But, and I knew that a lot of the midshipmen I worked with, and then later on, once back at Georgetown, I was sort of on secondment for three years at the Naval Academy, that when I was seeing people just coming home from the current endless wars, that um, sucking up and trucking on wasn't always healthy. Um, and so I wanted to think about the emotions and the blessings and curses of stoicism, because I don't think it's an unmitigated blessing by any means. Mm. Um, and it's important to read texts and find the full flavor of stoicism mm. that often isn't that's obscured often. So, you know, I ended up writing, it's pretty messed up here, a book called Stoic Warriors, um, yeah, which yeah. was the upshot of my th three years at the Naval Academy, the blessings and curses of suck it up and truck on. Mm. Um, and I really wanted to devour the texts to see how do they handle grief? How do they handle fear? How do they handle connection? Um, you know, one of the chapters actually was, was sort of named after Coriolanus, um, uh, Shakespeare's play, Permission to Grieve. Um, and then, you know, this book, Stoic Wisdom, mm -hmm. Ancient Lessons for Modern Resilience, was after three, after two other books about homecomings from war, because that's who I, I was teaching a lot of mm. soldiers about who were struggling with moral injury, which we'll get to in a second. Mm. I really needed to return to the Stoics in part because mm. I was on podcasts. I was on the BBC a lot. And my fellow colleagues chit-chatting would never talk about the connection aspect mm. of Stoicism. The idea that we are, as Marcus Aurelius says, you know, if you've ever seen a, a body on a he, it must have been a battlefield because yeah. it was during the Germanic campaigns mm. um, with limbs severed one from the other strewn. Mm. Th that's what a person makes of herself when she cuts herself off from, mm. from others. And mm. so, I, I mean, I knew this was, I knew that we had moved from the polis in Aristotle to the cosmos in the, in the um, uh, Greco Roman stoic world. Mm but people weren't really making the connection about how connected we were. And I've just found that that's the signature theme for me, that resilience isn't go it alone grid. It's not Marcus mm. alone, the lone historian, the Marlboro man on a, you know, <laughs> on, on, on the bronze statue in Rome. It is, you know, it is that he's got his hand reached out and that's a hand reached out. I always think to connect with someone and that's what he was doing. He was writing these things to him, these notes to himself. So I've come to Stoicism in part because I came to it from being steeped in Aristotle and in Plato, for whom Plato's symposium is something I teach all the time um, about love and eros and philia or friendship. Mm -hmm. And so I come to it thinking, you can't just give that up. It's there. And there was a book by Zeno called The Republic, which was about a community. Yeah. So I am not a, um, I'm not a kind of go alone grit self-reliance. That was Emerson. And that's what Waldo Emerson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, that's what some of the folks picked up on Stoics. But I don't mm. think that's the full story. I think um, we, we rise or fall by being sustained or supported by others. Mm. And we've got to see the social world out there, not just the social world, but we've got to see the world as the place we can interact and in fact change. So I'm not about accept and acquiesce. If it's, mm. uh, you know, if it's a uh, love of fate, amor fati, that's one theme, but it isn't the mm. pervasive strand for me. Long answer. I, I, 
<laughs> no, I love that. I love that. Um, I love that New York Times article, of course, that um, you kind of really interrogate the idea that we are approaching stoicism as a, just a, a self, self, self-help self rather than group help, which I really like the way you said that. But what is it about us? Why are we approaching stoicism like that? Are we, I don't know, I sometimes think that, I don't know if it's the American dream scenario or just this idea that you as an individual, you can do it, you you can change, you can get what you want, just work hard. Just so, and, it's, and there's, there's this burden on us to to be better, to do better, as if there's that we can do it alone. Is is that something in our culture? And is that why we're reading the Stoics in that way? That we have been told that the power's in you <laughs> to do whatever it is. Is do we have a sense of being a part of that? We we can't even ask for help these days, right? Well, so, mental so- health has always been stigmatized, so that yeah. is a national problem for us i think it's certainly a problem for the brits and and longer probably longer standing and more deeply because of you know what whatever it's you know uh, birdies stiff upper lip <laughs> wherever that comes from I don't, i'm not actually sure i actually say the stoics are like um the scottish because i it was scotland um, right so i think i kind of say that the scottish are so natural they're such natural stoics that like they'll just say it is what it is it is what it is okay 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 you know. that's great that's just well, from four years in edinburgh that's four years in edinburgh and many years on, on the top of the this you know the upper level of the bus yeah <laughs> a, yes. little, a little glaswegian in there not just yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> but i think part of it is the idea of um Self-help is an industry. I mean, mm. it's not just the need on the part of the, of the consumer. It's also the uh, producer knowing how to feed the consumer. So mm. if you're in an airport, um, you, you, know, you can turn to self-help. It's an old story. Carnegie Dale you know, wrote yeah. books long ago about self-help. So it's a version of self-help. Mm. And I think it has become a mega industry. You know, I don't like to think of myself as part of that, but I, mm. I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm feel like I'm a correction to it, um, a correction yes. to, you know, to the distortion, but I think that's part of it. And if you can do it online and you can do it by yourself without paying, or you can do it, um, you know, without the mental health system, uh, it seems okay because it doesn't seem to carry a medical and premature. Mm. That said, um, it's not always the best. Um, sometimes we need real one-on-one rapport with mm. professionals who can mm. give it, or sometimes you might even need med- meds. Um, you know, it's a, yeah. a large, a lar- um, well-being is a very, very large, complicated um, uh, thing. And so anyway, I think so- the self-help industry was there before um, popular stoicism and modern stoicism got there. Mm. And I think there's a little bit of a ugly aspect to it. And that is, um, you know, people have always for long, long have been interested in calm and equanimity through mm. Buddhist, uh, mm. philosophy, Eastern philosophy. So this is the Western Zen, if you like, and mm-hmm. it's yeah. got the imprimatur of, um, you know, Greece and Rome and, or, that area because the Romans expanded outwards Mm. Um, and classical, the class, the classics by that, I mean, Greco Roman classicism, you know, has been appropriated for a long time Mm. in sometimes misappropriated. I think Mm. that's the misogynistic aspect that's, that's online in Reddit and in the incels mm. and red mm. pill and mm. Zuckerberg exposes that. Mm. But if you just mm. go into the rabbit holes, you'll find a lot of that. Mm. Um, mm. And I think you're right. You know, guys have been into uh, following Tim Ferriss or, or, or others um, because it's a kind of um, it's grit. It's self-reliance, but I think mm. that's not the story at all. Mm. So mm. I do think it's group it's us, it's, it's, it's um, group, you know, group 
uh, therapy, if you like, not me yeah. therapy. And flourishing mm -hmm. in the ancient world has always been about the self as a social being. Mm. Aristotle had it very small, it was the polis or the mm. city state. And anyone at the borders really was barbarian because they said, mm. bah, bah, bah. That's yeah. how that term comes. <laughs> <laughs> Once you go outward, you know, not a pretty story, the Romans were expansionists, grabbing mm. territory. And they also understood in a way that Aristotle didn't, that reason was the province of humanity, that we share reason and that reason, and we share it, they said, with Zeus, God, and ourselves. And it was the whole of humanity that we shared reason with. And that became, that's a signature theme, obviously, in the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. because they just picked that up. Um, Kant is, uh, Immanuel Kant, 18th century, is really an Enlightenment stoic of a cert. He was reading Seneca, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was bedside reading that was just sort of easy to read. It was <laughs> yeah. what, you, what you would pick up. Yeah. And he probably yeah. read it in Latin. You know, it, that's yeah. sort of how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I think that idea of shared discourse and monitoring your rage and anger, fear, not so that you just can be calmer because you don't want to scream at your spouse or your child or your mm -hmm. boss, but so that we as a society across the borders can talk to each other out of our silos. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, the promise of stoicism. Mm -hmm. that we can monitor those impulsive impressions that you know, grab stuff out there and then make assent to the judgments inside, mm -hmm. we can press the pause button and realize that some of those impulsive uh, thoughts and feelings to sort of um, digest the stoic, thought, the stoic idea a little bit are mm -hmm. in fact um, filled with preconceptions mm -hmm. or prejudice or, uh, uh, you know, about the other. And the Stoics have this wonderful visual image here. Hierocles says, imagine you're just a little center and you're, they're concentric circles that go around you. Kith and kin, closest, tribe, that's the language, mm -hmm. race next to the farthest reach of humanity. Your mm -hmm. job is to take the farthest reach of humanity and bring it to your center, to compress the circles. And the catch stoic phrase is bring it home. Oikeosis mm -hmm. is make it akin. It's our word mm -hmm. for economics. Home economics is the is how we get the, uh, the term from, from, from the Greek, oikeosis, you bring it right home. Mm -hmm. And so you make the stranger, you take the stranger into your home and mm -hmm. make the stranger or the other, not other, but akin. Yeah. And I think that is the promise. That's kind of missed on a lot of guy talk, boy talk. <laughs> Do we need like an actual societal structure that reflects that in order to do that because I feel that we've kind of you know how we're no longer I mean I have a Greek background so you know back in the day the families were really close-knit so the family really existed and then you had like little villages which so it was just the village and then it was part of the bigger sort of state so that kind that kind of model you could kind of see it in reality do we have that we live kind of pretty isolated lives to a certain extent a lot of us live alone or um I don't know what am I getting at like do we have an actual structure that where that that kind of type of being in the world that that ethical approach to to being that out yeah what can we see that is it out well, I there think we do have sort of yeah I think I'll just move outward from where you were saying I think we do yeah. have family structures sort of religion is on the rise in many in many places okay. um yeah. I, th I think we have the reverse. I think we've got insulated silos. I mean, I'm not saying anything new. You know, the problem internationally is that it's very easy just to talk to the people you talk to. You read the papers yeah. or the, you read the feeds that you want and you come to believe what is said without any 
checking. I mean, it's mm. pretty hard. Well, actually, social media has really created um, and, and sort of pop journalism has created a mess. <laughs> I mean, it's created a way of hearing what you want to hear, mm. being echoed 25 times over and believing anything that, co- that pops up on Face chat, you know, it may have gave, given us the Arab Spring, which didn't last very long, but it also gave us what we're fighting with in this country. You have a, a smaller version of it, but mm. uh, it's 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 international. Mm. Um, w- there's a real real problem with having um, common touchstones. You know, people used to watch. I, I can't speak for. Britain, you know, the, 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 well, you still have the BBC, you know, as mm. government sponsored um, radio and TV mm. and its various channels. Mm. Um, but here, the major networks, which were a touch, which were a, a common text for everyone. Yeah. You listen to the mm. evening news with Walter mm. Cronkite, CBS, or, you know, or NBC. Mm. Those aren't what we have anymore. We have Fox News and PBS, Public Broadcasting System, Mm. or NPR, National Public Radio. Mm. And they don't talk at all to each other. And, and, you know, similarly, the um, two-party system has become absolutely broken. Mm. You know, I think parliamentary systems are better. So I think it's a bigger problem. But stoicism, Mm. if it's viewed as retreat to the inner citadel, empower Mm. yourself, because any adversity has a silver lining. There's always an upside to the downside, or you can be a phrase I hate, bulletproof mm. or anti-fragile, anti-fragility, another worse phrase. You never, no. are. <laughs> never are, you're vulnerable. Just accept it, you're vulnerable. And anytime you choose to interact with your family members, your university, your colleagues out there with people of another political persuasion, LBGTQ, you know, blacks, Jews, colored, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Scots, Irish, Northern Irish, you are, ex- you are exposing yourself to becoming vulnerable. And that, you know, so I think when you say, do we have to change something? I think we have to actually change social structures. So. And that's what racial reckoning has been about. This yeah. Week. We, yeah. Are, we are, you know, all over the world. Mm. We, um, we are trying, I think, to not just change ourselves and live with it, become enslaved. That's what Epictetus was. He was empowered while enslaved. Mm. Well, I don't want to be enslaved. I live mm. on a campus that was financed um, in 1838 by the sale of 272 uh, oh, yeah. enslaved mm. persons. Mm. The Jesuits needed to raise money, raise capital to build buildings. Mm. Mm. That's really hard if you come to this campus with a with a Jesuit education. Not that many have it, but some do. You may be African American, you may be Ethiopian American, um, you just may be looking like me. It's really hard to reckon with our past. You can't, you can't mm. turn a blind eye. Mm. So, mm. I, so I think if you view the Stoics only about me, self-help, leave the world as it is, because anything, any sling and arrow that comes my way is one I can handle and grow from. It's a not a philosophy of flourishing. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> pretty bold. Pretty bold. <laughs> but that's, that's yeah, that's a good statement. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about. Okay, let me take you to the book and mm-hmm. to the last chapter of Stoic Wisdom because I always skip ahead to the last chapter. It's just my thing. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, building a healthy Stoicism, which is pretty much you know what you've been suggesting. And uh, I, I guess maybe we've already kind of mentioned this, so maybe 
maybe we can move. But I was thinking, so that that healthy aspect of stoicism that you're thinking about is the one in which you um, obviously help yourself, but it's group helping the group as part of the group, right? Have you seen, okay, what's the most unhealthy stoicism that you've seen? Has it been in the military? Has it been elsewhere? I have a feeling I'm asking one of the same questions. No, it's okay. Bear with me. The most unhealthy stoicism, I'll give you two examples. Okay. Um, In the military, asking for help can be a career stopper. So unless... a a commander gives you permission or says, I know you're hurting. Um, You often don't ask for help. And so you, Mm. you, you you sort of um, button up, you know, pull your socks up and you move on. Mm. Mm. That's really, really dangerous. And I sat on suicide review boards. I observed um, at the Pentagon because we've had an epidemic um, during these wars. I believe it's, um, abated a bit, but the rates of, of suicide were higher in the military than they were in the comparable civilian population. And, you know, and, and seeing folks struggle with this, I'm, you know, the, the, the top brass, that was really, really hard to, hard to reckon with. But just my talking to service members who return home and, you know, I talked to them because they're in my class, they come to my office hours and we get to know each other. Opening up and being able to process loss, accidents, could have and should have, the guilt, what I call moral injury, um, incurring collateral damage because it's Mm. maybe the rules of engagement are permissive, Mm. but nonetheless, you you feel you should have transferred the risk to, to the combatants. Uh, um, or maybe not fought for that mission, Um, Mm -hmm. but you're at a checkpoint and people are running through the checkpoint in cars and they're going right to an installation and they've got three warnings or, you know, they've gone through concert or, you know, they're at the concertina wire and you got to do something. And so you end up shooting and there might be a pregnant woman in the car or a child, the burden of that, the moral burden, um, is uh, ruminate, there's rumination for years mm. and years and years. And not seeking help for that mm. through our, what we call the VA, the Veterans Administration, but your National Health Service incorporates military um, health, men- mental and physical, um, is devastating. So mm. th- that's just not a way to go forward as a stoic. Mm. Um, I think the misogyny is really ugly. And I think Mm. some people, uh, especially in online communities Mm. through Reddit um, or a group called Red Pill, which are sort of um, in celibates in part, um, they, they, this is an old, old, old trope, but you know, uh, the woman is the temptress and you better, you better get rid of that woman because she's bringing you down and they pick up it. peculiar strands of this and that it's appropriation misappropriation um greco as i mentioned earlier greco romans were misappropriated always the third Mm. reich did it as well um Mm. so if you you know if that's the sort of thing you spend your scholarly work on you will see it left and right so i think it can be quite dangerous it you need voices educators um who read widely, I think, you know, so the, the unhealthy flourishing is any downside is an upside. There's always growth that comes out of Mm. challenge. Mm. That's Mm. just not the case. Sometimes you have to change what's outside in order for us to flourish. It's Mm. not just the psychological, it's the social, Mm structures, political structures. We do not, we, you know, we, so I think that's the unhealthy stoicism Mm. to somehow just sever it from the worlds in which we live 
that are in some ways the, the problems. It's so one thing, you know, my husband was hit by a deer while cycling over the summer. And I was just talking mm-hmm. about this in a, another podcast. And, you know, it's one thing to be, you know, slings and arrows of fortune. Mm-hmm. You know, it was an accident. But the sto- that's one thing that's outside. You know, the deer was outside, couldn't make up its mind. It went this way. You know, my husband zigged and zagged. So did the deer. And, you know, man and buck collided. And man did worse than buck. Okay, now, but, you know, many fractured ribs later. The, yeah, <laughs> it was an was interesting summer of cyclist versus deer. Just as I had been finishing Epictetus on it's only your body. It's only your body. Well, it isn't only his body. It's his only body. <laughs> that said, wow, there's yeah. also, um, there's what's out there that is just fortune, but it's deliberate oppressive injustice. Yeah. And that is not something that you should just suck it up and truck on. In the military, it's called you disobey unlawful orders, even if it costs you a court martial. In Nazi Germany, we had the Nuremberg trials. Superior order defense is not a defense you, following superior orders. In a world in which mm-hmm. you're living with what we call in the States, Jim Crow, the, 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 the post Civil War uh, era legislation called Jim Crow laws, you know, which essentially was a continuation of enslavement um, through um, currently through voting rights suppression, um, is not something you just suck it up and truck on. So withdrawal, retreat, turn a blind eye. I don't think are empowering at all. Yeah. And so if stoicism has to get, has to realize it's, it's about social, mm. uh, our social being and our political structures as well. Mm. You can't, you can't just do it all through your psyche. We're not mm. prisoners of war. We're not Stockdale. You know, in Britain, one of my colleagues is Richard Sarabji. He's quite, quite mm. old at this point, but um, a really pioneer in the field of, Greek and Roman philosophy. Mm. And he brought Jim Stockdale to Oxford, I guess, in order to sort of um, view him a little bit like a lab rat. Um, how did he survive? And it was, and he's very endearing. Stockdale's very, very endearing. But I have to say this, I was interviewing Stockdale once and um, Sybil Stockdale, his partner, both are now deceased, um, was herself uh, really, really a, a force to be to behold. And Stockdale at one point in her interview said, um, you know, I, I, I take imprisonment again um, for the silver lining, which was his embrace of stoicism. At which point Sybil Stockdale ran in from the kitchen and she sat at the very table where she and other spouses were figuring out how to get their husbands out of Hanoi Hilton by going marching on Washington. She had many, many meetings with uh, Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense at the time under Nixon. She ran in and she said, I'll get my salvation a different way. <laughs> she had studied religion at Mount Holyoke in the States, I believe. Yeah. You know, she, this was a steep price to pay, she thought, for for that silver lining. Um, yeah, I kind so, of feel yeah. like, yeah. is there a bit in Seneca, like I haven't gotten through all the Lucilius letters, I'm sort of, you know, about a third of the way through Margaret Graver's translations, but is there a point at which he kind of says that, okay, life can be really bad and there might be many battles that you need to fight, but you wouldn't choose to fight the battles. You would, sure, absolutely. Right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't choose them. Although, you know, there are passages always because in the, in the, in the Stoics, wherever you read, you know, if, if it's kind of faded that your foot be muddy, then your foot should be muddy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, meaning you can't, you can't really outwit nature at times. Yeah. And so there's this idea of fate or laws of nature, but you know, Hey, we're not living in 
you know, um, turn of the millennium. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we, we, we know what medicine can do. Mm. Um, you know, we, not that we should fight against all diseases. You know, there's a point at which we do have to accept mortality. Mm. But oh. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was this very funny. She never talked about death at all. But she was 96, you know, and, and thought it was time. So yeah. 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 I said to my mom, she was in a nursing home, which she very much liked, a private nursing home here in the States. You know, yeah. we don't, it's not supported. Um, and she, I said, you know, mom, sort of remind me, did we sign up for the immortality plan? Because <laughs> if we did, it's going to be really expensive. <laughs> At which point she gave me this gorgeous, um, beautiful smile that she had, and it became our dance. That was our little interaction, how to talk about death. We were pre-rehearsing the bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, we were getting her used to the idea. And that I think my point here is that the, um, you know, yeah, you, you, you fight it when you can, but you yeah. also, at the very end, 96 is a good time to accept death. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I wanted to, you mentioned dance and, okay, um, I, I saw, uh, this is going on a big tangent, but anyway, I really want to ask you this, but I, on your about page on your website, you mentioned that you've been working on a project, a dance project. Um, mm -hmm. And I have a dance background. I'm like, mm, got to talk to you about that, that and the emotions, if we can kind of. Sure. Because I was thinking, you know, so I'm thinking about, emotions and how to exercise them, exercise, exercise them, you know, to get um, them out, to get them out, to Perform. release them to, <laughs> yeah. So, and there's, you know, the kind of ancient idea of catharsis where you just sit, watch a play and you kind of like cry and that's it. It's done. Or like, um, in, I don't know, maybe I got that wrong. Uh, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And then, yeah. so modern Greek, um, Zorba the Greek, right. Um, Nikos Kazantzakis' novel and, you know, became that novel. And so Zorba the Greek is kind of this quintessential Greek. And at one point in the movie and the book, I think, he learns that his son has died. And mm -hmm. instead of sort of crying and shouting and breaking things, he um, dances. So he dances as a beggar. That's right. And that idea of, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking... All of that, all of that. And then I read that you've got this like dance thing happening and how does that all, and then I want to ask you the Stoics, do they have a sense of releasing the emotions in that beautiful artistic way through dance or the arts, etc.? And okay. if we just reasoned our way through the emotions, there's a lot for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, we reasoned, if we reasoned ourselves through the emotions, would we ever have dance and art? Okay. Okay, so over let's, to you. Yeah, let's begin. Right. So I do have a dance background. I've done modern Ooh. dance much of my life. Okay. And a number of years ago, I was really honored to be at NYU in the New York City a Center for Ballet and the Arts. And I was brought there in part to think about the military and dance or cadres and companies, if you think about that, military cadres and dance companies. Um, and I ended up writing two papers, but some of it makes its appearance in um, Social Grit and Resilience, uh, if that's the name of that chapter. Yeah, Social Grit and Resilience in Stoic Wisdom. Yeah. And that is this idea. So as I said, I've always been interested in emotion. One of my graduate students really was interested in emotional expression, which is what you were talking about. And I realized I had written about that a long time ago, a long time ago, because I was reading Seneca on favors or benefactions. And I had been reading a lot of Cicero and the, there's a, there's enormous amount of, of, of material, which I developed in a whole series of papers about emotional demeanor, about how you express emotions. So the Stoic, this just a little digression here, but the Stoics have this idea that, that emotions have two tiers of judgment. The first is you assent to an impression and a value, it's an appraisal. Uh, they have insulted me. She's insulted me and it's a bad. Okay. 
that may give that I'm now talking about anger. Yeah. Second judgment is an assent to an evaluation about how you should react. And I'm going to punch her out or I'm going to scream. So it's two tiered, uh, 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 an affective reaction about uh, something out there that's happening to you and a response. So it's very behavioral cognitive, cognitive in both of those judgments and behavior in the second one. Mm -hmm. Well, that second one, uh, 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 and Cicero and Tusculan disputations spends a lot of time talking about that. That second one is emotional expression in part. It's your demeanor. It's not just, mm -hmm. I'm going to go like that, but I'm going to, I'm going to cry. And, you know, or, and not just natural tears, but I, I will, I, I could stop them at some point, but I'm going to luxuriate in them a little bit. If you're at a funeral, um, I'm going to say, it's okay. I give myself permission to cry. Mm -hmm. um, so they have this idea that you're expressing emotions not, not, you know, not exercising them, but ex expression can both be the, um, you know, the inner going out, but it can just be the outer. Um, faking it is outer only. <laughs> you don't feel it, but you, you fake it. Mm -hmm. um, fake it till you make it, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Maybe then you get to feel it. <laughs> um, and you, and Sis a Seneca, for example, says, um, giving uh, a, a, a gift or, or yeah, giving a, or maybe it's showing gratitude or giving gift. Can't remember which way it goes, benefaction or gratitude. They go together. Um, mm. Giving a gift with a furrowed brow is like giving a uh, bread with stones in it. Giving uh, and there's a whole discussion about, you know, giving with uh, grimaces is as good as not giving being thankful with a scornful face is not, the, the Romans were into decorum. They're into demeanor. There's, you know, this is Miss Manners could have a, you know, a time of it with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and Cicero says similar in the Tusculan disputations upon loss of his daughter, Tullia, he's in retreat in the Tusculans out of Rome. And he's finding every, he's not a Stoic, but he's a traveler. He knows the Stoics. He's a crit critic at times, but he's reading all the Stoics and he says in letters to Atticus, if I, I might uh, buy Cleantes, or I, I, I agree with Chrysippus in the second judgment that I may be able to control my tears, but I don't agree at all with the first judgment that I haven't in fact suffered a loss. Ah, I will yeah. never agree with that. And then he gives all sorts of ways to, you know, that he will maybe change the second judgment, but not the first judgment of registering the loss. He'll change the emotional mm -hmm. demeanor. So dance comes in because it is not just facial expression of, you know, furrowed brow, grimace, um, but it's hand gesture. I'm moving my hands a lot right now. And so I'm animated, I'm emotional, but uh, you could also dance. So, you know, I do modern dance and one and Martha Graham and contractions. Oh my God, yes. Uh, you know, and I studied at London School of Contemporary Dance for a while. And so is that your inner going out? You know, maybe sometimes, but good dancers don't have to really feel anything other than stage fright. Uh, yeah. what, what's their partner doing? Am I, is my timing right? You know, are my legs longer than my partner? So I have to mm. move more slowly in order to be able to partner and mm. sync. Mm. So there's a whole area of a emotional uh, expression, maybe of inside outside performance, which isn't mm. the inner going outer, but is performing um, expression mm. in a different sense. Mm. There's also dance in terms of synchrony. Um, you know, whether you want to get neurological and talk about mirror neurons, uh, that's a big jump. But there's mm -hmm. a way in which you can both proprioceive your own body movements. You know, if you overstep the leap, if it's if you're about, you know, if, if, if you're not um, uh, doing things right without looking at your body, you just feel mm -hmm. it, feel it, you know it. Um, and you also sort of figure out, am I you kind of feel the other person's body, at least in the sense that you figure out how you have to move with them. That's true in cadres too. I felt, you know, fell in love with a book uh, called in parentheses, first world war 
um, a, um, a contemporary of Eliot, a Welsh fusilier and Londoner who um, writes about the Battle of the Somme and what it is to be moving in a cadre. You hear mm. on the tin, t the tin, the, the raindrops on the, you know, on your tin cap or your Burberries, how they move and rustle across your knee. That's a rhythm. The mm. steps. That's, you know, you're hearing it in front, you're hearing it to the side, you all got to move together. They're yeah. dancing as a cadre. And that's, and it's also their salvation. If they, if they didn't move together in battle, they couldn't survive emotionally, psychologically, because they have, but armies survive on buddies, on cadres. Um. And and it's shown in the body how they're moving, how they how they get from you know where, where wherever they are, you know, from being dropped off on the shores of France, just you know, Belgium, Flanders, and moving right across. Mm -hmm. um, so I think now, did the Roman long answer? Do the Romans or Greeks have this? Sure, all of those Greeks who are on stage performing in a chorus on a different season, we're out doing drills. I mean, because the you moved from the chorus to the battlefield, mm. that was civil mm. life. And similarly, mm. um, you know, I, I can't speak of the Romans. The Romans weren't as interested in dance in that way. Mm. Uh, it wasn't part of the theater in the same way. Mm. Uh, but, you know, in the theater in Greece, it, right through the Roman times was, were, was about homecomings, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. Seneca's writing that you know Trojan women, mm. which is about post bellum justice after war, mm. and there's not a lot of mercy. That's what that that's about. Uh, Hercules rages. He's just come home from all his labors, you know, which were like war. Kills his family and then doesn't want to live himself, and he's he needs others to support him. So they're they're dance tropes, if you like, in theater, mm. um, and. I ended up thinking a lot about dance as a real form of being in a flock. You know, it, it's how you connect. It's a very powerful form of, of social connection. Mm. And it's a kind of trope for moving together in time mm. through muscle, almost through muscle, muscle memory. You, you not only know what you're doing, but you kind of pick up what someone else is doing if you're a good dancer and yeah. you're not dancing alone. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah, that's really interesting, actually, because I've been thinking about solo dancing as that expression, that kind of raw dancing that men do sometimes, the Greek men, after like a loss or your heartbreak, um, that solo dancing where the grief is expressed through dance, which takes okay. me back to men and the emotions, actually. How do men express emotions? I've seen men on Greek in Greek taverns and on Greek dance floors that really do that Zebek Eagle dance. And it's just all the emotion just coming out through the body. Well, you know, here at Walter Reed, which is the National Military Medical Center, um, they do dance therapy as uh, and labyrinth, you know, work, um, as well as art therapy, making masks. Mm. Um because for many words are not the medium, you know, yeah. it's not the medium of expression. Yeah. Writing words really don't work, but dance sometimes does. So movement therapy is, has been standardly used as mm. one of the modalities um, for therapeutic um, work. I mean, by trained um, clinical psychologists mm. who may have a dance background and others use art. You know, they use the, by friends who are, uh, child therapists and they use sand and materials mm. that have tactile responsiveness and that's you know how how you you talk over the or through the tactile response and sharing that in some way I mean so, I, I don't know the spe specifics yeah yeah would a would a kind of talking therapy or a, a reason therapy be used in in parallel to dance and art Therapy. Yeah. So here, you wouldn't just not talk about it, would you? Well, mm. here, I'll just give you an example because I know it. Part of the um, treatment. At, so we're now talking about uh, service members who come home who are 
in treatment, um, not outpatient typically, but two or three weeks at a place called the Intrepid Center, uh, National Intrepid Center of Excellence, NICO. And it, you know, it could be two, two plus weeks. It's very intense and they'll do all sorts of things. Yeah, talk therapy in conjunction with mask making. I don't mean World War I masks where you come home and you have tin, tin faces because mm. you've lost something. These are masks, I have slides I can show you at some point, in which you, um, you express what's going on. You know, you'll have cracked skulls, PTSD, TBI, traumatic brain injury, fear, anger, and then the names of buddies you know, erased one after another because these are losses. Huge question marks like why? Where do I go from here? So there, there are words that are mixed and some of them, you know, have barbed wire um, um, locks on their mouths. They, they don't know what to say or how to say. So it's one modality combined with mm. um, talk therapy in groups and pre- in 101. And then also typically with a dance therapist who mm. may do dan- group dance movements, that sort of thing. And they also do um, um, meditations of sorts, you know, typically mm. Eastern, not, not, not chatty discourse, but quiet discourse, mm. figuring out mm. ways of finding calm mm. in addition to b- body, a lot of body work and massage because there's terrific um, physical pain many endure. Mm. So a, a full compliment. It just, I think yeah. good therapists are creative and yeah. know all the different modalities, but it's training. This isn't, this doesn't, it just doesn't pop out of the air. <laughs> mm. Did you find that expressions were, uh, emotions rather, were expressed differently in men and women in the military? Was it's hard to ever... say because, you know, many, I've often dealt, I've dealt more with the officer class um, rather than enlisted. Mm. Um, and so, but not entirely, you know, a lot of, women who really rise are kind of alpha males. They, they have to out alpha male, the alpha male. And Mm. that means they sometimes it's sad in some ways. They, um, they feel that they have to um, be more macho than the guys. And they'll even, Mm. I mean, one person I talk about in after war, I think, and who's now, now has gone on to head up um, a a major department in one of the academies. Um, And she was a pilot. Um, you know, she was abused. Um, I never wanted a woman on the base and here you are, I'll do everything to get you off. You know, you're, you're disrupting, um, custom and tradition. I mean, right in her face. I mean, and that's, that's not outright sexual assault. And there's a ton of that. Um, and hard to prosecute because it's often your own leaders who may even be complicit who are on the, boards prosecuting but Mm. they will suck it up really in order to be able to move on with their careers and it it's very very hard Mm. um so i don't know if you know that's some taking on a more knowing what they have to do in order to make it or survive Mm. Mm. um others um (laughs) i was once at meetings at naval academy where um we had women officers and myself um, where they'd say, you know, I'm sick of these panties, you know, regulation panties are horrible or regulation shoes. And they look at their feet, they look disgusting and they don't, and they don't, you know, they don't fit. Um, There were conversations galore about why do we have to have these white, white trousers in the summer, very, are very sailor, right? Navy sailor. Mm. They show everything. And when there are pockets, they show even more. And so Mm. there were conversations endlessly about how to get the pants to look right and not be cut for men, but be cut for women. I mean, it's kind of like the afterthought that they they come upon, right? So, you know, when it came time for whites in the summer, not always a pretty, (laughs) pretty (laughs) I mean, that's a bit trivial, but, um, you know, yeah, yeah, it's very hard to, it's very hard in a patriarchal system to move up. Um, mm. And so we're, we're mm. just starting to see more women break through the ranks of mm. flag officer. And that's very, very, very moving, but you know, it's hard for them often to come forward to about sexual assault and rape. 
if, no, if you, it's not only women. I mean, men it's not only it's not men only men are yeah, raped. Men raped too, yeah, regularly, routinely. Yeah, yeah. I can't imagine. Um, uh, if I were to ask you, so of all the ancient Stoics, if you were to send one, um, who would be the best therapist to send to a military? Huh. Sort of. Oh God, that's a hard question because I, uh, I'm going to question the question. Yeah, <laughs> go. <laughs> I, I don't think therapy is like, oh, here it is. I can be a therapist tomorrow. <laughs> you know, anyone that's a parent knows. Boy, does it take a lot of training. About the best leader of a uh, timing, timing, timing. <laughs> <laughs> know each kid. One kid yeah. is totally different from another. Yeah. And, Developing rapport is the name of the game. But if I had someone who I've found inspiring to read reflectively, whether or not I can't imagine them in a room, it would be Seneca. Yeah. Because I think Seneca is, he's, he's very complicated. He's really dirty in some ways. He has walked in really muddy waters. <laughs> And that is, he, you know, was in the in, in Nero's court as mm. his apologist, as his mm. speechwriter, and so he he knows the pushes and pulls of political structures and social structures and complicated people, and he's often, you know, toning his work for his audience to know who know he's talking to, and so uh, the letters to Lucilius, who's you know a real person, but these letters were never sent, we believe. They're, they're yeah, I didn't know that. I was just listening to one of the other podcasts and I'm like, I was having a chat with Eve Richards who um, does some stoic mentoring and stuff and she was like, no, listen, they're not real letters. And I'm like, yeah, they're real letters. And like, yeah, I sent her the link to your podcast to say, you were right, Eve. <laughs> it's an ep epistolary form. Yeah, right? of course. Yes, and he wants sense. those letters to be, it's kind of weird for a stoic, but he wants himself to be a memorialized through them yeah and they're also his retirement theme he's in seclusion yeah. he's been kind of banished so he's writing these letters where he's very frank yeah. because he says i'm the doctor as well as the patient i'm in the sick room with you if i if i wasn't i couldn't understand you yeah. and i couldn't understand anguish and vulnerability and so you always want a therapist who Mm. knows the psyche and its twists and turns you want a therapist though who doesn't um engage in counter transference too much but you, ca you can't be a therapist mm. that, that is to mm. be frank. you know a patient typically has some sort of attachment to a therapist it, you know it's a long-standing relationship of some sort like yeah. a child gets attached to a parent yeah. And they project a bit onto the therapist. And the therapist, in turn, has responses and reactions to a patient that cause their own psyche you know, to bubble up with, ah, that was what it was like when I was a kid. Or oh, that <laughs> reminds me of my spouse and what she does. And yeah. thoughts wander. And sometimes that's really, really helpful for being able to understand empathetically what the patient is going through, because yeah. at that moment, you're kind of vicariously living a little bit, but you obviously don't want it to get out of hand because then you're treating yourself and not the patient. <laughs> that is why training is very useful in therapy. It's a big, it's like, Can you imagine sending uh, Seneca into. <laughs> so he's writing training. to himself. Really. Yeah, he's writing to himself yeah. really. Yeah. 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 But he knows. Speaking, he, yeah. Yeah. He knows humanity. And I think he's, a, he's, I just yeah. love reading him. I think he's yeah, soft, I do too. soft at times. He's, yeah. he is a brilliant, brilliant writer. Yeah. Um, that's yeah. why Agrippina, as evil as she was, <laughs> um, Nero's mother, brought, said, Claudius, get this guy out of Corsica. It's not the Corsica we know now. Bring him back to Rome because she said to herself, I want him to be the tutor for my young prince. And so he can learn how to give great speeches. I don't think, you know, I don't think um, Seneca knew how to play the liar. I don't think he taught him 
how to play the fiddle. <laughs> um, but I think he taught him a lot of things and, you know, and his speechifying was the gift of Seneca's. Yes. So I think Seneca's, Seneca's my guy, but you know, I, I, I'd first go with for a trained, a trained psychotherapist, <laughs> okay. probably someone with a lot of years <laughs> who maybe could give meds when it's needed and who knows a little bit about the brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, good choice, good choice. <laughs> Um, I want to get back to your book before I have to say goodbye to you. I don't have a hard copy because that's not coming out in Britain until yeah, the 1st of July. 1st, 1st of July, July, I think. Yeah. yeah and Amazon. I've got the Kindle. I've got the Kindle. Okay, yeah. good. Good for you. Yeah. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the yeah. team at yeah. Oxford. A great cover. And one of my beloved Beautiful. colleagues, Julia Annis, saw the cover. She immediately saw this and dated it specifically and knew what it was from. I can't remember, but. What a what a class! Oh, what a class! Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. You yeah. know, one one. I mean, there's so much great stuff. I mean, yeah. Everyone everyone wants to read it, obviously. Um, but I, I I noticed that you mentioned is it Philo of Alexandria or Philo, Philo of Alexandria? Philo. Yeah. And I came across him via Pierre Hadot because you know I'm really interested oh, yeah, in writing yeah. and journaling. And mm -hmm. supposedly he he had written down some of the ancient writing exercises that they did so kind of like just spiritual exercise or whatever i think hado calls them spiritual exercises so mm -hmm. memorization and and writing and um and then a bit of reading a bit of research so this this list of exercises philosophical exercises training that um the ancients kind of got um interested in and that's what really um made me interested in just I started rethinking how Marcus Aurelius was writing because he kind of rewrites in a way the um the Stoic teachings so he's kind of constantly kind of working on them rewriting them etc in his meditations so yeah it was really nice to see Philo there so Philo's an interesting character I don't know specifically the writing exercises, um, and I'll have to think more about that. Um, and, you know, Marcus is reasonably well-educated. He always says he isn't that educated, wishes he were smarter. Um, that's a theme, but he's just jotting things down that he would have been taught. So it's, a, you know, and I think that's part of the appeal. It's not always the appeal for me. I have to say, well, I taught the meditations. I even read a new translation that I had um, blurbed on by Robin Waterfield, which was great. My yeah. students didn't have that. They had an older translation by Farquaad, I think. They said, please never assign this again. <laughs> I mean, these are graduate students. And I think my undergraduates would say the same. This was oh. their two comments. One, it's not systematic discourse. Yeah. Here, there, here, there. Secondly, it doesn't even read like a narrative, you know, like give me a good story. No beginning, middle, and end. And they said, maybe if you want to do it, Professor Sherman, a quote here and there, but you know, we're not into pithy quotes here and there. That's not what we're in. <laughs> so I have to say, Donald Robertson, you know, sorry about this. <laughs> I, having taught it, he doesn't have to teach, you know, and, and grade papers on this. <laughs> I have never, you know, I think I, this is shared by many of my colleagues. Marcus Aurelius was an emperor. He was a second rate philosopher at yeah. best. Yeah. So he's just picking up stuff to get by. That's in the air. I can't quite describe it. It's just, yeah. Yeah. it's his religion. You know, they're not going to yeah. be Jews. They're not going to be Christians. They're sto Stoicism is the secular religion of the day. Yeah. Yeah. And so that he's writing it yeah. like a breviary as if yeah. it were a religious breviary, yeah. reminding himself how to be good. And if this pops into his head, that's how it pops. And yeah. if that pops into his head, <laughs> and all the acknowledgements that are at the beginning, I'm grateful for my mother and my writing tutor who didn't correct all my howlers and grammar yeah. mistakes. <laughs> that was much later on. It was a modern yeah. translator that stuck yeah. it in the beginning.
beginning. And, and so, Gregory Hayes in his <laughs> translation, which really blew my mind and that kind of made me feel a bit better about reading the Marcus Aurelius. He, he actually says that Marcus Aurelius does no original philosophical work in the meditations. He's just nothing. kind of he's just picking talking it up. to him. Yeah, yeah he's so, just picking stuff up. So yeah, you know, he's, yeah. like a, he's like a school child a little bit writing down and my tutor said this and my tutor said that and my tutor, that's, that's really what he's doing. Yeah. But it, it survived and it's a yeah. very wonderful example of someone, yeah. yes. a military leader. yes. In yes. the dead of night, he was probably, we think, um, you know, he probably woke up early. He, he talks about being in a stupor. He, they drank, they drank mm. a lot as they marched. They also used opium. Yeah. Uh, you know, probably the, the body pain was horrific. And so he is at times mm. in a stupor writing, you know, at, the, at his bedside table, you might say, when he wakes up in the middle of the night. That's, I think, what's partly going yeah. on. Yeah. So Philo's an interesting case. He's yeah. A Jew from Alexandria, he's banished and he's yeah. in Alexandria. He makes pleas on behalf of the Jews to Caligula. Um, and so there's, a, there's, there's history there. Um, but he is a contemporary probably of Seneca. And they have, what fascinates me is that in his allegorical retellings of the Bible, so he goes through Genesis and others, he picks up one of the more interesting aspects of Stoicism, I think Seneca also discusses it at length on anger in book two, and that's proto-emotions or propathei. And mm. they're what, you know, if, if you follow neurobiology, 20 years ago or so, Joseph Ledoux, um, leading neurobiologist at NYU, talked about low road and high road emotions. Mm. Low road go right through the bottom of the, um, of the um, brainstem, you know, and quick responses. You see a bear, ah! um, you know, an enemy comes at you with a bayonet, you know, you, 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 mm. you, you, you run fast. Um, high road responses are more mediated, cognitive, you know, um, neurologically, they're happening up here. Mm. And um, pro pathei or proto emotions are these quick starts and startles. They're your, they're your autonomic system. Um, I'm going, um, yeah. starts and, you know, you're blushing, you're turning green, pallor, um, Seneca talks about. And Philo um, has these wonderful phrases. Um, he uses these proto emotions, which you're not, which are very, um, the will has minimal engagement. So you can't be really held, you can't be impugned yeah. for yeah. showing them. So, mm. Abraham goes to the grave of Sarah, I presume in Hebron, but it goes there to cry. But the other part of the sentence, but doesn't yet cry, meaning he's on the verge of crying, has a, uh, you know, but then holds back. He doesn't assent to the impression that there is a loss which will then. And more important, doesn't ascend to the impression, the behavior, to let out the, to let it all go. Mm. Sarah has a nervous laugh. I'll my phrasing, laughs upon being told by God that she's going to give birth at a hundred years of age. Really, she says to herself, <laughs> "You got to be joking." <laughs> so she goes <laughs> something like that. But she doesn't fully laugh because she hasn't yet embraced the divine joy. So these are Stoic, Stoic uh, patriarch, matriarch that are meant by Philo to be Stoic sages. He's, I mean, this was in the air. He's reading the Bible and matriarch and the founding, you know, mothers and fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Leah, Rachel, Rebecca, Sarah, Leah, Rebecca, Rachel, as Stoics. And how do you deal with their emotions? Well, you give them a full Stoic dressing. Some of them are proto-emotions, some are ordinary emotions, and some are good emotions. Those are the three, we didn't get to this, but those are the three layers of Stoic emotional experience. Wow. It's fascinating. So Philo is a brilliant example. He's one of our sources a really critical source for understanding the 
prescience, I'd say clairvoyance of the Stoics in understanding the complexity of emotional life, that there are these um, quick arousals, starts and startles. First, mm. few, Augustine thinks of an erection because Aristotle did. Stoics did as a first thing, you know, it's a first mm. feeling. You may not be held guilty for it, or maybe mm. you will, <laughs> because <laughs> it happens. <laughs> it's what happens <laughs> next. <laughs> and then <I> <laughs> ordinary emotions, yeah. uh, you know, fear, yeah. desire, pleasure, pain, and then there are good emotions. You find a lot of that in this really wonderful source um, that's understudied, I think, but quite brilliant. Well, yeah, thank you so much for that. That was like loads of fun finding that in the book. And there's so much great stuff in the book. And I know I have to let you go, but I don't want you, but I know I have to. So <laughs> another time, <laughs> another time. Um, yeah, I would love to catch up again and talk about oh, so much. Thank you so much for your time. Um, as I said, you know, we're all so excited about the book and hopefully you'll um, hopefully we'll see you next year at our women's conference. That's great. It might even be in person. Imagine that. Yes, please, because we'd love to have you as I our keynote to, speaker. There you go, I, informal invitation. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to do that. And the, um, the book hardcover yeah. will be out. In, uh, you probably can pre-order. Uh, um, it, I don't know quite how it works, but I know in the States you, you could pre-order and they were coming out much faster than they said. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I would encourage people to pre-order if, if through Amazon or, you know, or private bookseller yeah. it's definitely there on amazon i've seen it. yeah so just pre-order yeah. and it will come because they're they're in print and you know and atlantic transit can't be that long <laughs> yeah. it's a great book thank you i wish you lots of fun with promoting it and talking about it and um i hope to see you again very very soon thank you thank so you much. Catherine. a delight right. see you Have later yeah, absolutely bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.